together is only the beginning. It's keeping together that changes everything. Between our best moments and our worst. Between our finest hours and our lowest points. Between two Sundays, we discover that we're always better together. Well, good morning, Bridge fam. How are you this morning? So good to see you. A very special welcome if you're joining us online or in Columbia. We love you guys. And uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 2 today, if you want to turn there. But before we do that, real quickly, I know we've done a lot of celebrating, but I also want to celebrate what happened uh, just last Sunday. Uh, We had 54 people say yes in baptism. 54 people. And if we could throw that image up there, I just think this is such a beautiful, I know you can't actually see anything and that's kind of the point. Like, I I just want you to know that um, there was something really, really tangible about celebrating together people stepping from death to life. And I just, well, I was was an emotional wreck the whole day. I don't know if you could tell or not, but uh, I just wanted to celebrate that together because that's not our doing. That's the Lord's doing. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to change hearts and change lives. And we just get to be along for the ride and what a gift it is. So I'm getting emotional already. Um, Let me just pray. I'll pray and then we'll dive in. And um, if you wouldn't mind, if you're comfortable, a posture of both receiving, but also a posture of letting go. Let's go before the Lord. God, thank you for what you're doing in our midst, God. Thank you for entrusting us with your mission, with your gospel, for allowing us to be a part of your work in the world at all, God, is uh, it's a miracle. I'm grateful, God, for what you're doing in our midst right here. God, would you move and stir and redeem and heal and restore in ways that only you can, God. We thank you and we love you and we pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, who's got their cell phone on them? You laugh because that's everybody, right? Every, yeah, people are like, ha, ha, would never leave without it. Okay, so show of hands, who loves their cell phone? <clears throat> oh, don't lie in church. It's, okay, show of hands, who hates their cell phone? Who, okay, who sort of like loves and hates their cell phone? It's, yeah, that's, okay, that's more honest. I'm in that camp. I want to play a quick game real quick, if that's all right. And uh, I want you to turn your ringer on. And I want you to turn the volume all the way up. There's a prize in it for you, by the way, for those of you not participating. This is in Columbia as well, online. You can play in your living room, whatever you're doing. Um, ringer on, volume up, and uh, here's the game. I want you to call someone in this room who you didn't come to church with, and the first ringer to go off gets a prize for you and that person. You ready? Set, go. Call that person. They have to be in this room, but you didn't come here with them. First ringer to go off. Where do I hear? Do I hear a ringer? Okay, that over here, Bethany, is Bethany in the room? She's got, uh, she's got some, uh, some gift cards right there, and we got gift cards in Columbia as well. Okay, okay let's, let's give it up for our uh, technologically addicted. <laughs> See, 25 years ago, uh, that wouldn't have happened, right? You guys remember the time when our phones were attached to a wall, right? We were confined to a three-foot space in the kitchen for our entire life. And today, now, 2022, we're constantly available. We're constantly accessible. In fact, I would argue perhaps we're just a little bit too accessible. Here are some stats that I found. They're not on the screen, but I just want you to hear how uh, overwhelming this is. 47% of Americans consider themselves addicted to their phone. 53% never have never gone without their phone for 24 hours. 71% say they look at their phone within the first 10 minutes of the day. And the average American spends nearly three hours a day on it, which translates to 44 days a year. 44 days a year every year connected to our phone. Now to be honest, to call this a phone almost seems silly. Like I don't know about you, but like for me, the phone is like the least used app (laughs) on my phone. 
And if you use it on me, by the way, I'm furious. Anyone? Uh, like, tell me if you can relate to, to this right here. Uh, me waiting for my phone to stop ringing so I can text them and ask what they wanted. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone guilty of that? Like, just stop calling me. What do you want? Or maybe, maybe you more relate to this one here. When someone calls you instead of just texting back, right? <laughs> who can relate to this poor kid right here? Uh, people who call instead of text me, we just hide entirely. I found someone, this isn't mine, but this like best articulates my posture towards the phone. The best time to call me is text message. That's just so that we're, we're all aware. I heard a comedian, he said, calling the cell phone a phone is like calling a Lamborghini a cup holder, right? Like <laughs> technically it does that, but it does, it does so many other things, which is why we're so deeply connected to it. And I think it's a problem. We're accessible, but are we actually available? We're accessible, but are we actually available? Because I believe that deep down in our core, God has designed every single one of us for like meaningful connection, meaningful community. In fact, there's 59 one another's in the New Testament. It's hard for me to imagine that we were meant to live those out via a screen. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament is Ephesians 4, verse 16. It says, From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We are meant, friends, to be joined together. But notice what he says. It doesn't just happen automatically. It's as each part does its work. As each part, it takes work to actually be connected, to be available in the kind of way that I believe God has called each of us to be, which is why we're calling this series Better Together. I believe with all my heart that we are just simply better together. Eugene Peterson, a pastor that I've admired for years, he said it this way, there can be no maturity in the spiritual life, no obedience in following Jesus, no wholeness in the Christian life apart from an immersion in and embrace of community. I am not myself by myself. And there's a big difference between being accessible and being available. And I would argue that today, as a people, as a culture, we are lonelier than we've ever been. There's some staggering stats from the National Library of Medicine. This is this year, by the way. 52% of Americans report feeling lonely. 47% report that their relationships with others are not meaningful. 58% say they sometimes or always feel that no one knows them well. 73% of millennials say that they are lonely. In fact, later in the study, they found that 25% of people admitted they have no one that they consider a close confidant. 25%. I mean, like, do the math, right? One, two, three, four, sorry, no one. One, two, three, four, bummer, sucks to be you. One, two, three, can I say that in church? <laughs> this, this one won't go on the website. Um, in addition, loneliness is likely to increase your death by 26%, and it's as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now listen, maybe those stats surprise you. My guess for others is they don't surprise you at all. Maybe you feel the reality of that loneliness yourself. And I just want to simply say, I've been there. More times than I care to admit, by the way. What I'm hoping you'll see today, though, is that this kind of isolation, this loneliness, was never a part of God's plan for us. It was never a part of his dream, his hope for us. God's design is for us to both know and be known. To both know and be known. And modern science, I think, is finding this out to be true. There's a Swiss researcher named Johan Hari, and he gave a TED Talk about a, a study that was conducted in the 1980s in Vancouver involving rats. And rats were given the option to, to drink pure water or uh, drug-laced water, and they, when by themselves, they always went for the drug-laced water every single time. But what he found was fascinating. When he put rats in cages with other rats, toys, and food, he noted that they reacted to it drastically different. And the scientists discovered that if you took solitary drug-addicted rats and placed them in a cage with other rats, they no longer used the drug-laced water. Human beings, likewise, crave connection, bonding, and love. And when meaningful connection is missing from our lives, we often run to some kind of an addiction to fill the void. And here's what Johan said, and I love, I love this idea, and I think he's right. The opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. 
The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection, it's meaningful relationship. So how do we, how do we actually do that? What, what does that actually look like? To answer, I want us to go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 18. It says, The Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So right from the get-go, at the beginning of the creation story, we see that humans were not meant to live life alone. Up until this point, every time a day was ended, God would step back and he would just say, oh, that's good. He would look back at his creation and kind of give himself like a Trinitarian high five and say, man, way to go, waterfalls, good call, forest, beautiful, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. But when he steps back and sees Adam by himself, it's the first time that God says, that's not good. That's not good. That's not going to go well. Thankfully, God is going to remedy this. Verse 21 so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Which, by the way, ladies, men have been falling into a deep sleep since the creation of the world, apparently. <laughs> okay, just, just go easy on us. <laughs> it goes on. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, what I love about this is that in the original Hebrew, what Adam says here actually rhymes. It's a poem. It's a song. He's like whipped already, apparently. That's, but that's his response to this loneliness dilemma being fixed. And I don't want you to miss this part because um, right before his song, right before his poem, the text says that God brought her to the man. That God brought her to the man. All throughout scripture we see that God is a provider who loves to give good gifts to his kids and his response, Adam's response, the first recorded human words is gratitude, is a song, it's a poem. And I don't think this passage is just talking about marriage, by the way. I think it's describing the kind of connection that we all long for. And it's something that God provides because he knows that we need it. He knows that we're deeply wired for it. We are designed to know and be known. In fact, connection, I believe, is essential to flourishing. We see this just a couple of verses later, verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Perfect, unblemished connection. It's vulnerability without shame. And this is what deep down I believe we are all wired for. And not just connection with each other, by the way, but also connection with God. This knowing and being known was intended to actually also be vertical as well as horizontal, to not just be known in community here, but also to know and be known God. But that intimacy was very quickly severed. We see in uh, chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? It's here, and I want, you to, I want you to note something very specific here. This didn't begin with an argument, but with a suggestion. The serpent very subtly asks a question that I believe is being whispered to the ears of many of us today. Did God really say? Now, like, typically the temptation is depicted here as like the temptation of an apple, but like, who's ever been tempted by an apple before? Anyone? <laughs> like, you throw some caramel on that bad boy, and then maybe we'll talk, but like... I actually don't think it's about the fruit at all. The temptation wasn't about an apple. It was a temptation to disbelieve God's goodness, to disbelieve his design. Listen to Eve's response to the serpent. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now this one's easy to miss, but it's actually not what God said. You turn back to chapter 2, verse 17, here's what God actually said. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God never said they couldn't touch the fruit, and I think, and this is just conjecture, 
I think these slight alter, alterations to God's remarks suggest that Eve has already slightly moved away from God's heart and towards the serpent's attitude. And I think a centerpiece for this whole story, and many of you are very, very familiar with this story, you know what happens, but I think a centerpiece is the question of the knowledge of the good. The snake implies by his question that God was holding out on Adam and Eve, keeping knowledge away from them. So they disobey, they eat the forbidden fruit, and immediately after they eat, here's what happens. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves, and the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Humans were not created just simply for intimate connection, community, relationship with one another, but also with God, and now they're filled with shame. And what do they do? They hide. They hide. They go from walking with to hiding from. And I think many of us have been hiding ever since. When we feel the sting of shame, our impulse for most of us is to hide, to head to the darkness. And I think there's a lot of different ways that we can hide. For you, maybe it's achievement. Right? Maybe you hide behind achievement. You hide behind accolades and awards and plaques on the wall and people speaking well of you. Maybe achievement is the thing that you hide behind. Maybe for you it's humor. Maybe you hide behind humor, to be really blunt. Like, that's a struggle for me. That's one that I often, when things get uncomfortable, I do it even in preaching sometimes. If I feel like the weight of something in a moment, my, my tendency is to deflect with humor so that people don't get too close. Maybe it's distance. That could be physical or emotional distance. Maybe for you it's hurry. I think maybe a lot of us hide behind hurry. We always have somewhere to go, something to do, something to achieve. I can't have any, anyone in my space, in my life, because I'm in a hurry. And maybe it's religion. That one feels different, doesn't it? I've heard it said that religion is one of the safest places to hide from God. Some of us, if we're really blunt with ourselves, Religiosity is the thing that we've been kind of holding up to keep people at arm's length. We play church and we say the right things around the right people so that people don't get close to us. So how do we actually, how do we actually connect the way that we're supposed to? I think the only way is to stop hiding. The only way to not just simply be accessible but available is to stop hiding. The only on-ramp to connection is vulnerability. I think we resist vulnerability. I know I do. Probably for a myriad of different reasons, to be honest. I love what Brene Brown says about this. She says, vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It's our greatest measure of courage. Yes, and yet, and yet we treat vulnerability like it's, a, like it's a dark thing, so we like armor up, right? We like put up the shield. Vulnerability, I think, is at the center of every difficult emotion, but it's also the birthplace of every positive emotion, love, joy, and belonging. I love the way that C.S. Lewis talks about this in his book, The Four Loves. He says, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around the hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. To love is to be vulnerable. And some of us, maybe you're hearing this for the first time or you've been hearing this your entire life, but if we actually want to live in the kind of connection and intimacy that we were designed for, that we were built for, it's going to take vulnerability. 
I think the best way to step into that kind of vulnerability, by the way, is to join a small group. If you're not in a group, I cannot encourage you enough to join one. There's going to be some info on the screen. Scan the QR code. Go to the URL. If you just ignore everything else I say today and just sign up, that's a win for me. And some of you are already in a group, but maybe you've just sort of attended and you've checked a box and it's a thing you do because you know that it's a good Christian activity to do. Lean in to community. Be fully there, fully invested, fully transparent, fully vulnerable because that's where healing takes place. Let's stop hiding behind achievements and humor and hurry and religiosity. I, I think many of us who have done those things know that it's exhausting. It's not the kind of life that we were designed for, that we're invited into. I want you to think back to our story again in Genesis. After Adam and Eve's rebellion, by the way, God comes to the garden to clothe them. Even in their disobedience, God gives them what they need and the same is true for us. Even in the ways that we've screwed up and hid, God draws near to us. He clothes us in Christ. I love the way the Apostle Paul put it in his church to the, letter, uh, to the church in Galatia. He says this, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. When we were ashamed, Jesus came and clothed us, knowing that we are fully loved and accepted by God, gives us the courage to be vulnerable with each other. Knowing that when we could do nothing to clean ourselves up, to be holy or righteous or successful enough to earn God's favor or affection, knowing that it's a gift, knowing that God sees you fullest and loves you the most. Think about that. God knows every deep, dark secret, the things that you maybe not even articulated to the closest people in your life, the thing that you maybe never even spoken out loud, God sees it and says, I love you with a love without brim or bottom. Yeah, that's, that's such good news to know that we are fully seen and known in Christ. He clothes us in Christ and it doesn't stop there. That's not just for our own benefit so that we can feel loved by God. That should affect every single human relationship that we have. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are fully known and fully loved and when we actually open ourselves up to others, we're living out that gospel truth. Like listen, my, my right standing before God isn't based on my performance. It's not based on how good my track record is. It's not even based on how holy you think I am. Neither of us get to decide and that's really, really good news and that frees us up from stopping and playing the game. It frees us to not have to pretend anymore. I can't tell you, I'm embarrassed to admit how many different small groups I've been in over the years and how strategically I shared next to nothing. I went, I attended, but I wasn't really open. I wasn't really vulnerable. And what is that? It's shame. It's shame. I think we've all experienced it to some degree. I was doing what Adam and Eve were doing. Hiding and thinking I could hide in the trees from the one who made them. <laughs> to know that God sees you fully and completely as you are right now. That God loves you today, not some future version of you when you get your life together and you've memorized a few more verses and you've gotten a few more good deeds under your belt. He loves you and sees you completely, utterly, fully right now. Amen. That's good. And invites us then yes. to stop hiding. To stop retreating to the shadows. To stop lying to ourselves that that's just a better way to live. And not just for our benefit, by the way. Jesus says, you'll know they're mine by their, what? Their love. The world will know that the message of Christ is legitimate, not 
not by their mission statements or their websites or their building. All those things are good. Jesus says, this is how the world knows, by how you actually treat one another, by how you live in community with people who maybe look or talk or act or think or vote differently than you. I think a suspicious, onlooking world says, wait, these two people are breaking bread together? Those two families meet every week? Are you insane? They're serving and loving. I, they don't seem to have anything in common. And that might be the case, but we do have the most important thing in common, and that's the blood of Jesus. Amen. And if we have that in common, friends, that's greater than any distinction, any difference that we may have. I love the way that Francis Schaeffer puts it. He says, our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final apologetic. That's taken me a long time to kind of come to terms with. My prayer for a lot of my life is like, Lord, let me, let me do something big for you. Something, something dramatic. Something earth shattering. And all the while, I think God has been inviting me to do life with people that, that look nothing like me, talk nothing like me, think nothing like me, to do the hard, patient, beautiful work of life together, of the intimate connection that we were all built for. Friends, stop hiding. Stop hiding. The best next step you can take today is to join a group. Join a group. Just try it. Just lean in. Make a commitment to yourself. I'm going to give it X amount of weeks. I'm just going to try it for a month. You can go on the website. You can talk to someone in the lobby afterwards. They would love to help you answer any questions you have, help you navigate the website. Do not leave today without taking a step towards the intimacy, towards the connection that God has wired us for. This isn't just a church idea. It's not just a ministry. I don't want to be the kind of church that like offers small groups, that offers community. But I want to be one that's built on it. I'm doing life together in the trenches, boots on, let's go. Not for our sake, but for the sake of the world. It, it may not be the easiest thing. In fact, it probably won't be. It's what we were designed for. Take a step in that direction. Let's know and be known by the God who designed us that way. Let's come out of hiding and let's show the world what love looks like. Let's pray. God, I know that um, for some people, I'm preaching to the choir today. And for others, if they're anything like me, uh, this can feel like surgery, like a sting, God. Would you, even in this moment, would you highlight in our hearts the thing that we've been hiding behind? The thing that we run to to keep intimacy at arm's length? God, would you remind us that by the power of your blood, the cross, we don't have to live in shame anymore. We don't have to live in hiding. That you love us with an unthinkable love. Thank you, God, for pursuing us again and again and again. Help us to take one courageous step today, God, to know and be known, not for our sake, but for the sake of the world. We thank you and we love you. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus and everybody said, Amen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.